I am Mike Shentrup. I'm a captain at the Gainesville, Florida Police Department. And for those of you from around the country and in the world, uh, Gainesville is a community in Florida, about two hours north of Orlando. So if you went to uh, Disney World and you jumped on the interstate and you drove two hours to due north, you're going to end up in Gainesville. So Gainesville's uh, city and uh, area population is about 250,000. And we're known because we're the home of the University of Florida. So we are a um, university town, a uh, very educated community, and we're very proud of the uh, the Gators. I am a graduate from the University of Florida, so of course I'm partial. My wife graduated there and my kids. Now, I it's it's weird for myself because I've taught a lot in uh, in-person trainings, but you never see your own face, right? When you teach in person, you're just teaching to a crowd of people. So I got to tell you, it's a, I've always said I have a face for radio, uh, so now I'm like on TV, right? So, um, but having said that, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I am the uh, patrol support commander, which basically means I kind of do everything except uh, what the patrol officers do. So I'm in charge of the canine unit and the aviation unit and uh, the uh, traffic unit. I'm in charge of the SWAT team. I'm in charge of all the other things that kind of work to help patrol. I'm also, in sh I'm also the emergency management coordinator for our agency. So that's kind of how I got involved very early on with coronavirus response. And um, because that was my job to prepare and stuff like that. I do have 23 years here at the agency and I've worked through all different capacities. Um, so I think uh, luckily I feel like I was prepared personally to take on this mission, but nothing could have prepared us at all for what we went through um, in the last few weeks. Fortunately for us, I can tell you that the city of, of uh, Gainesville here, we have about 282 cases as, as of this morning. We've had five deaths. We have one nursing home that's been hit pretty hard, um, and uh, so we're not too bad, but uh, we have a very progressive community, and we implemented some social uh, distancing and some stuff really early on to try to mitigate uh, the, um, the, the COVID-19. So we were, we were ahead of the game by a little bit, not by a lot, but by a little bit, and um, we were ready to go early on which is, I think is a, a tribute to us and how we try to prepare. And we listen to our locals. We have a lot of very smart people, obviously, in the, um, in the city and in the town, and we listen to them. So today I'm gonna, well, that's me. I look a lot better there. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about a timeline, you know, kind of how the whole this thing got started, maybe some of our initial planning some logistical needs or your supplies and stuff like that. We'll talk about um, workforce management, which was really hard. Uh, mental health and well-being, which kind of rolls into that work, workforce management. And I know something you guys are very, uh, this is kind of what you do. You know, we're going to talk about how does, have we seen a difference in suicide? Have we seen a difference in domestic violence, in overdoses, uh, child abuse? And then finally, I'll wrap up with some of the leadership issues and some of the mistakes we made um, and the lessons we learned through these first eight weeks or so of the coronavirus crisis. So really, like anybody else, I was, um, you know, I pay attention to the news. I'm, I would guess what you're saying is I'm a news junkie, so I do watch the news quite a bit. And you saw something starting to occur in China and you really didn't know how bad it was. And you hear about the whole province of Wuhan being shut down. And in China, what we now know is when China shuts something down, that's a lot different than when we shut something down in more of a free and open society. So there was information coming out. We knew it was a pretty contagious disease. And um, early on, you know, and, and I, I kind of went back to kind of see how I started thinking about these things when I was asked to present. And um, on January 31st, even by CNN standards, um, 
or anybody's standards, you know, in America, this seemed to be isolated to China. And a lot of people thought that. Um, and we thought there would be a little bit of overflow to the United States. There would be some cases, but I kind of pushed back in my mind to the Ebola virus, which we were very concerned about because it's a very dangerous disease. But when it came to America, we were able to isolate it really fast. And I think they ended up with 20 cases or 10 or 20 cases in the US. And it seemed to be a, a, a lot to do about nothing. And I was wondering, is this going to be the same thing as Ebola virus? Or is this going to be different? You could see in February that this thing was starting to change and we were starting to get some cases in the US, but almost all of them were travel related still. You know, I remember the date when I first heard there was one community spread event in California. I think that was in mid, mid uh, February. So we're like, okay, and then by um, uh, and then on those days, right on January 31st was the same day, the president formed the coronavirus task force. So as me, we get into mid-February, um, I didn't want to overreact. I didn't want to make us, you know, overreact, but I knew that I had to do something. It was my job as the uh, emergency management coordinator. So I started to think about you started hearing all these stories about supplies. We didn't have any masks. I said, well, I don't know, do we have any masks? So I started looking into that. Um, on March 6th, let's, we're moving kind of into March now. I went to a local hospital, had a round table on um, coronavirus response and uh, they did a worst case scenario. And I'm like, wow, holy cow, maybe we are behind a little bit here. Could it get as bad as what they were talking about, like hospitals being over flooded, crowds storming the doors, wanting to get in, security for hospitals? And I don't know that I was there mentally yet to kind of uh, agree that we, we would get that far, but I had to start wrapping my head around the idea that it was a possibility. So we started talking about masks, right? And um, I went to... Uh, our supply, our logistics. And I said, how many masks do we have? And they said, we have 105. We have 105 masks for an agency of almost 300 sworn officers, not to mention everybody else who's working. But to be honest with you, I did not know the difference. I'm the emergency management coordinator and this is my fault, okay? I will accept the responsibility. I did not know the difference between what I have on the screen here, an N95 respirator mask, which is on the left, the blue one, and a basic surgical mask. I didn't know there was a difference. I was smart enough early on to, when I realized supplies were getting um, uh, taken, that I went and ordered 500 more from Amazon and I paid extra money to get us some masks. I got us the ones on the right, the surgical masks. I thought they were the same thing. In fact, March 11th, I even put this quote in here, on March 11th, I wrote to our police officers, N95 masks, AKA surgical masks, are what we use for protection against airborne illnesses. That was me writing this to the line folks. Um, so even in mid-March, I was still trying to figure out the difference between two, these two things. And that's my ignorance. And you know I've accepted it and we've gotten to where we need to be. But um, it was, uh, um, it was a learning process for me, too, to go through a pandemic. The interesting thing is, is on maybe February 26th or so, I um, reached out to our emergency manager for the city. Our city has an emergency manager who works for the fire department. And I asked him, do we have a stockpile of, uh, of masks? And he says, no. And I says, well, don't you think we should get some? And he says, well, if you want to. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So even at that point, even our own citywide emergency manager who works for GFR did not see this thing moving into the um, into what it became. So um, uh, on February 28th, I sent out the first department-wide email letting our, our our agency folks know that we were planning and uh, we did have thoughts and we were moving in a direction to try to prepare. So then we get to early March. March 1st, Florida declared a public health emergency. But everything in Florida, at least, really started moving uh, the week of March 9th. 
Um, that was a very crazy week. It started off routine. My kids had tournaments at the end of the week. They were still going to school. We had high school baseball activities. We had everything was just a normal week. And let me tell you, by the end of that week, nothing was normal. The NBA suspends their season on March 11th. You have the um, NCAA cancel their tournament. You're thinking, what happened? What's going on? Uh, by March 13th, which was a Friday, Friday morning, the schools say, no, we're going to stay open. By Friday evening, the governor shut all the schools down. So it was a crazy week, and um, it was just one thing after another. And we were really ramping up at that point, trying to move forward. So on March 12th, this is a, uh, an email I sent out to our entire agency. And I just wanted you to kind of see where we were at on that day. And I hope you can see some of the things. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But we had learned from previous emergencies, um, especially hurricanes, because we're in Florida, we have hurricanes, that communication from the command staff uh, was sometimes sparse, not enough. Sometimes it was jumbled. We had many different leaders sending out different department-wide communications, or they would just send out emails to their chain of command. Um, and a lot of times we left our non-sworn or our civilians out of the information loop. We made a conscious decision after that last hurricane and before we went into this um, emergency process that we were going to send one message. We were gonna have one message and we were gonna to try to send it out daily. And that was our goal, to coordinate all the messaging through me. Now, it was me not because I'm a especially adept messenger. It was through me because I was the emergency management coordinator. And it was my job to kind of bring all the messages together. Um, me and the chief and our uh, command staff agreed we were going to be very transparent because we had to be transparent because if we weren't, because we didn't have all the answers. We had to kind of let people know where our thought process was as we're moving through this, because number one, we want to let them know what we were thinking. And the fact is, we got a lot of great feedback because at the end of every email, I put my cell phone number and I told people to get in touch with me if you have ideas. And every day since this email on March 12th, uh, I have sent out an email. Now I will say the last two Sundays I have skipped uh, because it's not as much as it's been going, uh, not as much has been going on. But um, uh, this is an example of how we tried to communicate and keep the messaging open with everybody, sworn and our civilian staff. A lot of these messages too were about rumor control because in emergencies, there's going to be a lot of rumors. So I remember on March 13th, I sent out a, a Part of my messaging here, just it, it was always bullet points just like this. I wrote that um, the University Police Department received an anonymous cyber tip advising that there was a COVID-19 patient at one of our local health hospitals. I had checked with our local county health department. They advised it was not true. This is a rumor only. Again, that was part of my job for rumor control. Ultimately, we're going to get more patients at these hospitals but we did not have one at that time. And people were concerned because we actually have a person who works at the hospital 24 hours a day. So some of our workforce management issues, you know, we had to determine what about those people who were returning from travel, right? What about those people who still wanted to travel? What about personal travel or work-related travel? What do we do with sick employee, employees and how do we compensate them? You know, if you were returning from travel, it was easy. If you went to Italy and you came back, that's easy. If you took a cruise, that's easy. But early on in the um, crisis, South Florida was the hotbed early on for us in Florida and still is. But that's where we have in a lot of our, um, what if you just traveled to South Florida? Uh, what if you traveled to New York City? And initial on, our planning was that we were going to lose 30 to 50% of our workforce. And a lot of agencies had to plan that way and how are we gonna respond? 
So um, to either, not, not just to the illness, but we may lose our workforce to quarantine or isolation also. So that week of the 9th and 13th, then you had the following week. The week after that, which was the week of March 22nd, was our traditional school spring break for our public schools. Well, what happens then? A lot of families take trips, right? A lot of families take trips. We had to make a decision, how are we gonna treat those folks when they come back? What if they fly somewhere? What if they um, go to New York City? What if they take a cruise? Um, ultimately, early on, and this was um, March 16th, we did this. We put out a memo to our folks that if you traveled, you know, you had to report back to the agency that you traveled somewhere. And then we would make a determination if it was high risk travel or maybe low risk travel and you could return to work. But at that time, since we were making these mandates, we decided we had to pay people to quarantine um, if we forced them to stay home. What we did do though, is on um, later on is we canceled all leave. And this was after the spring break week. We had a lot of people who had made some plans to travel. We allowed them to travel and try to do it safely. Um, but that week after we canceled all leave after that and made mandatory reporting. And the reason we canceled leave is we felt like if we canceled leave, we could also limit travel. But we were uh, worried about our workforce too. And um, we didn't know how many people we were gonna lose to this, uh, to either COVID, the illness itself, or quarantine. And then if the employees got sick on the job, you know, us in general, and I'm just as probably guilty as anybody else. I've all, I grew up like if I'm sick, if I have a cold, I'm still going to come to work, right? And because um, I figure I'm either going to have a cold at home or I'm going to have a cold at work. And a lot of people are like that. And we had to say, listen, you've really got to stay home right now. If you are sick, you've got to stay home. We, we spoke to our supervisors. If you even think somebody's sick, we got to make sure you send them home. And then who's going to pay for it? Is it going to be sick time or is it going to be uh, GPD time? And the city agreed at this point, it was too vital to protect our workforce. We're gonna pay them to stay home at that point. Um, and, and we did that. And then you had older employees. Did you make them stay home? Would you tell them they had to wear a mask? What about those folks with underlying health conditions? These were a lot of things early on that we were struggling with, not just as an agency, but also as citywide because we had to try to have at least maybe have some uh, guidance from our city uh, governance to try to have a, 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 a um, unified message across all different departments. So more workforce management, you know, we talked about the different things. And the funny thing is, is that you, if you've never been to Gainesville, you, you started, you came here, you thought, oh, the weather's great. I will tell you in the spring, most people say it is probably one of the worst places to live in maybe the world if you have allergies. Every tree in the world, we have lots of pine trees. Allergies are something that folks deal with all the time. Now they had to figure out, is this just an allergy or am I getting sick? Do I have a sore throat because do I have a sore throat because I am, uh, you know, just because of my normal allergies? There was a lot of extreme fear. And of course there was no testing early on, very little testing. So we had to decide uh, again, are we gonna tell people to stay home even if we think it's only allergies? And we did out of an abundance of precaution, stay home, patrol officers, patrol officers can't work from home, right? We can't do this, we're police officers. We gotta be out there in the streets responding to calls, responding to emergencies. How do we have patrol officers work from home? It's not very easy. Luckily, we didn't lose a lot of the workforce, but we didn't know how bad it was gonna get early on, and we had to kind of work through these uh, scenarios. But the, the hard part was, is that we had to put our folks back out on the street and um, in a very uncertain environment, right? Nobody knew we knew, nobody knew how bad it was yet, 
in Gainesville, Florida. We knew there were some cases, there were only a few cases, but there was so little testing, nobody had a real grasp of how bad it was or how not bad it was. So we had to give the officers some guidance and we did early on, we wanted them to limit their contact with others. We wanted them to socially distance. Um, but how do you politely ask somebody to step back from you? You know, especially if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody who's just trying to tell you what's going on. We're not talking about bad guys. We always socially distance from them. It's called officer safety. But how do we tell a, a citizen, hey, you're getting too close to me. Can you take a few steps back? Some people would get, um, uh, would not like that. But what about if those people are showing symptoms? Our messaging to our folks was, if you go to a call and a citizen is showing symptoms, you politely ask them to put on a surgical mask. Well, we've never done that before, right? That's not something we ask community members normally to wear a surgical mask, but we did that. And if they didn't wear a surgical mask, then we told our officers to put an N95 mask on and try to keep their distance. We couldn't force a citizen to put a mask on. Um, we limited our per two person units. We told people don't ride together. But what about people in field training who are still learning to be police officers? They're not allowed to be on the street by themselves. They're not even allowed to drive a patrol car by themselves. We had to work through those issues. Um, but what we did do is if we went to somebody's residence, we told our folks, hey, politely ask them to step outside, talk in the open air, right? Talk on the porch. If it's a private matter, go to the back door ask them to talk in the backyard, um, but try to really limit your time in a confined space. The hard part was, as much as anything else, was trying to convince officers that you're as much likely to catch COVID-19 from your coworkers as you are from the community, right? We, we're very leery of people we don't know but we trust our brothers and sisters with our lives every single day. So for us to socially distance from them is very unusual. So it was very hard for us uh, as command staff to try to reinforce the idea of, hey guys, separate a little bit. What we did do is we told everybody to hold their briefings outside. We tried to move people out of the station. And we did do, with a lot of civilians, we did allow them to telework. But early on, anybody who had a fever or who got sick, everybody, not just me, I mean, everybody assumed that they had COVID-19. And we had plenty, we had several officers here who came down with what I guess in the long run would just be the routine flu. But the assumption early on was they had COVID-19. So anybody, any officer they came in contact with now needed, wanted to be quarantined or needed to be quarantined. What do you do with them? Do we, and what if they didn't want to take that back home to their family? Do we put them in a hotel room? Who pays for the hotel room? We ultimately paid for those hotel rooms to try to make our folks feel safe. And the problem when it's again, those people who had the flu and, but didn't know it, assumed they had COVID-19, the testing was seven to 10 days away to get their results. Not like it is now where we're in a 24 hour cycle. Back then it was much more, um, it took a lot longer. But these were some very complicated um, decisions we had to make as a command staff and as a community, and it was not easy. And I will tell you personally, I made mistakes because what I did is I imparted what, how I felt about the possibility of being sick with COVID-19 into other people's perception, right? Especially our, our, our employees. I thought some people were overreacting because I was looking at the data and the data was almost everybody who tested here in Alachua County was negative. But um, I made that mistake early on and I realized I had to disengage myself from that and leave it in the hands of employee health services. And from about uh, the middle of March on, they called employee health. I completely stayed out of it. Even if employee health asked for my opinion, I said, I'm not giving my opinion anymore. I don't want to impart my own personal thoughts into this. We'll let employee health work with our local uh, medical providers to make the best decisions moving forward. But what about now? I mean, still, as of April 28th, um, 77 police officers have died from uh, COVID-19. 
28 of those are from uh, NYPD, of course, where they've been hit really hard. And I don't know if you see it, but um, just underneath the uh, top line, it says, this number has surpassed doctors and nurses combined. You know, and I challenged that number. So I had to go do a little research on my own. And I don't think the numbers are great, but the, the closest thing I saw so far was a, uh, a, a recent article saying 29 nurses and doctors have died of COVID-19. So obviously, if you go to the hospital, those doctors are prepared at least to know that you may be um, very contagious, right? Officers don't have that. We meet people on the street all the time in very dynamic situations. Now we're trying to be more cautious but you can see, in, at least in NYPD, so many people came down with this, they caught it from the community because they didn't know what they were getting into. So um, I will say at our agency that nobody has tested positive yet. So that's, that's been fortunate. Ooh, okay, let me move up move a little faster here. Um, some of the things we kind of uh, decided for workforce management, we decided to start taking temperatures uh, pre-screens for employees here coming into the building, but we couldn't get our hands on touchless thermometers and nobody wanted to be touched by a thermometer. I'm not talking about even the one that goes in your mouth. I'm talking about just the one that touches your temple. We're not letting anybody touch our forehead. So we had to kind of work through that, you know. N95 uh, respirators are supposed to uh, create an almost airtight seal. So guess what? I don't know if you see that the, uh, you, you see the, um, the description of all the different types of hair you can use. That's from the CDC, all the facial hair. We forced people to shave their beards. They were not very happy. People are very attached to their beards. I will tell you that. Um, and then we had to make a decision. Are we going to mandate that our patrol officers put facial coverings on right away as soon as they enter, uh, exit their car? And what about if they work inside? Overall, Fatigue and mental wellness, that kind of goes together. There's been just a, uh, you know, in the last week it's kind of eased up because we feel like there's an easing, but there was such an overall mental fatigue, kind of a hypervigilance. You're always out on the street. You never know who you're going to come into contact with. Hypervigilance is an issue cops have dealt with for years, but you added that one more stressor of um, uh, very contagious disease. And we took away their ability to have time off. There was a lot of overtime canceled because there's a lot of extra functions that police officers were asked to go work or officers get to make overtime. Well, guess what? All those functions got canceled. Some people rely on that money to help feed their family. Not to mention a lot of our officers and our civilian staff had their loved ones might have lost their job. So a high stress environment overall. We do give out resources. We have a lot of resources for mental health, but cops in general are stubborn. Um, we have a critical incident stress management team, a SISM team, kind of like a team, and we did use them during this process to reach out to officers who, um, who uh, were, were under some stress. I will say we did lose one officer who just resigned. Now, he did get sick, and I will tell you this, um, the stress of that incident getting sick made him realize that he could not be work as a patrol officer anymore. And uh, he resigned to take another job, not as a patrol officer and not work in a police uniform anymore in his life is what he told me the other day. So I think this was the last uh, piece for him to go ahead and resign. Logistics and supplies. Um, everybody was trying to get these things, everybody right? So we had to be creative. And I will tell you, our lieutenant in charge of uh, logistics was super creative. He would scour websites, he'd order stuff, then he'd cancel orders, then he'd order somewhere else. Um, and he did a really good job for us. Uh, we, we sent our staff all over the city looking for disinfectant. And uh, they, they came up like champions. It was hard. They had to go to a lot of different stores, but we were out there. They were out there working hard. Luckily, we had a previous employee, a previous lieutenant who worked here at GPD. His name is Dan Stout. He now works for a company called Tac Tactical Medical. 
and uh, they developed a hand sanitizer product. And he called us right away and said, hey, do you need any? We said, heck yeah, send us whatever you have. And we were very fortunate, but those are some of the connections we've made in the past that really paid off. And it's a big thank you to Dan Stout and TAC Med. Dan Stout, if you're on the call here, uh, uh, shout out to you. Uh, we had a lot of people donate surgical masks, but the funny thing is, is the CDC keep, kept changing what they thought was appropriate, right? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask, wear a mask all the time. Don't call it a mask, call it a facial covering. So ultimately, I don't know if you see this little black thing right here. When we started going toward the idea of facial coverings, we realized our officers may be reluctant to wear um, surgical masks. So we went out and scoured the internet for a bunch of what these, these are called gaiters. And they're easy to wear around your neck and to pull over your face um, in a uh, outdoor environment. <coughs> but what they're really good at is if you had to go into an, a dynamic environment where you wore your N95 mask, you can pull the gaiter over your N95 mask and keep it secure. Because what happens when you're trying to shout and talk with an N95 mask on, sometimes if they're not large enough, some of them are smaller, they'll start moving around and you'll lose capacity there. Well, how do you enforce emergency orders, right? And essential businesses, whose job is that? And are we as law enforcement gonna be the bad guys enforcing all these things uh, when we've tried to build relationships with the community? So that was hard. We took a tiered approach here at the Gainesville Police Department. I think we've done a pretty good job. We use city code enforcement early on. Uh, we worked with GFR, our partners, our Gainesville Fire Rescue, who did some, you know, some counting and helped us with some enforcement of how much capacity is inside a business. Um, but everybody had their own idea of who's essential. And when the governor or the city manager puts out a notice, some of it's open-ended and, and there's some interpretation in there. Ultimately, our city manager has said, I'm gonna be the one to make the decision. And uh, he did, and we had to work through some of those things. One example is, what does delivery mean? Like, you know, you were allowed to run a business and have stuff delivered to people. Well, some people thought delivery meant I deliver it to two parking spots over. So we had businesses that were open and then would deliver the product to, you know, the parking lot next door. That was their idea of delivery. So we had to work through some of those things. I will tell you that for the most part, we got really good um, compliance throughout our community, which is a, a, a hallmark I think we've seen throughout the country. Uh, everybody's done a pretty good job. We've uh, very little enforcement as far as we didn't have not arrested one person. We've had a couple written affidavits that we've had to send to our state attorney's office, but nobody was sort of taken into physical custody. Uh, we gave clear direction to our officers about this, though. This was another thing. We told them, you will not stop people on the street driving and ask them if they're going to an essential business or essential work. We made that a no-no. We did not want to become a police state, and we felt, felt like that was crossing the line. And we never enforced social distancing, but the example is like if you had to stand six, four, four feet apart waiting to get into a grocery store or something. What we did enforce, though, pretty vigorously is large parties, large um, ad hoc gatherings. We dispersed those crowds when we came across them. We did charge one uh, party organizer also because he was constantly violating that rule and he decided he was not going to um, not going to abide by it. We had to make a decision, are we going, if we arrest people, what are we going to arrest them for? We can't just, you know, let people go. We saw people who are committing violent felonies. What about domestic violence? In the state of Florida, we have a mandatory arrest policy. So our jail, never stopped taking people. They had come up with a process to isolate them if they were, they were showing symptoms. And luckily our jail has not become a hotbed because I know some jails have. So we've been, um, we've been fortunate there. But um, during transport, we mandated that our officers wear N95 masks and roll down their windows. But we also had to decide about differential response. And we had to let our community know that we're not going to come to every single call that we used to in the past to kind of limit, limit exposure. 
So suicide, uh, we had two very public suicides um, during the crisis and our community became in concerned about what was perceived as an increase, not to mention national media is reporting there is an increase. So we had to do some research internally. And I will tell you, there is a difference year to year. Year to date, there's definitely a difference. And uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID in this time frame, there's definitely a statistical difference that can be identified. Now, it's not large numbers. We're talking the difference between two and four, but that's still a, a statistical difference. So what do we do as a community? We're having uh, mental health awareness and we're trying to do some community functions all online, of course, and town halls to try to reach out to those who are feeling especially vulnerable at this time. For domestic violence, we have definitely seen an increase in disturbance calls, all disturbance calls across the board. But domestic violence has been weird. It's been going up and down as we've been tracking it week to week. Our city government felt we should intervene. They said, well, why don't we just go and knock on the abusers doors and see what they're doing? We said, whoa, hold on a second. You can't do that. We had to coach up our city staff on the idea that these victims have to feel safe when they report. Us coming to their house and knocking on their door could be put them in more danger. So we had to figure out creative ways to engage um, the victims of uh, domestic violence, which we have a, a domestic violence grant here through OV, uh, OVW. We've been on the forefront of domestic violence issues for probably 20 years. So we have a very um, good unit. We have a domestic dedicated domestic violence unit and we, have a, we integrate very good with our domestic violence partners uh, in, um, in, the, um, in the community. Child abuse, um, we know that most child abuse either comes through the school or comes through the doctors, right? And what has happened, and you guys are probably on this right now, we have gotten very few reports of child abuse, but a lot of them come in through Department of Children, Families and Health who are not making those routine visits anymore. So we are concerned about what that's gonna look like in a post COVID environment. In overdoses, we have not really seen an increase in overdoses. We've actually seen a decrease. We do not have a big opioid problem here. Uh, I'm knocking on my wood desk right now here in uh, Alachua County. So um, that's a good thing. Last slide, guys. Uh, leadership. We're going to start with teamwork. Obviously very important uh, in our line of work as cops. We cannot do this job alone. I'm not talking about just our sworn. We're talking about our non-sworn, our civilian staff too. We always have to work together. And the, the, you know, from a line folk and from a leadership perspective, we have to make our folks believe that we are all in this together, not just us and them. Motivation is difficult. Folks are worried about their personal and family safety. Um, and, um, you know, so we are, so how do we motivate them, right? How do we motivate them? Competence and skills, um, you know, even competence and skills is tough because you're always going to have a segment of your workforce who doesn't feel like management does anything right, especially if they don't agree with it. Um, and now you're in an environment where really nobody knows what the right answer is. So how do you show competence in that type of environment? It's not easy. And I think for me, I think for our command staff, really, it, there had to be a little bit, I don't want to call it vulnerability, but I, had, I, I want to say that we had to let folks know that we don't have all the answers. We are learning while you are learning. We are going to be flexible with the way we do things. We made decisions, and then let me give you an example. We made a decision early on that we would not accept food from anybody outside our agency. Like, people would want to donate food. Pizza joints would want to give us pizzas to feed our folks here, just out of the goodness of their heart. People would bring by food and stuff, and we said we're not taking anybody's food out of the abundance of caution because we felt like if one person at that restaurant was sick, we could lose 20 people to a quarantine at that point. So we were very um, concerned about taking food. But after a couple of weeks of that, we realized that maybe we went a little bit too far in our safety. And we kind of reeled that back a little bit. 
we allowed local restaurants to donate food. In fact, we started feeding our night shift folks because they were having a hard time finding open restaurants due to all the closures. So I think on that competence line, I think what the folks wanted to see was that you're actively thinking about these things, you're worried about their safety, but you're vulnerable enough and you're reasonable enough to know that you're not perfect and you're gonna to listen to what other folks say and things can change. You know, we had a responsibility um, to balance the needs of our employees with the needs of our community. And um, during COVID, we still had violent crime. You know, we, we still have a, a youth gang issue here in Gainesville, Florida, and they were still doing drive-by shootings and acting a fool. So we had a responsibility to our community to still try to keep them safe. So now all of a sudden we have a mixed message. We told our folks, hey, we want you to kind of not go to these calls, answer them, but take these calls by phone, try not to interact as much with the public, only do a traffic stop if it's an egregious traffic violation. And on the same time, we have a responsibility with our community to keep them safe. So we had to tell them to, all of a sudden now we're telling our officers, by the way, I know what we said over there, but we still need you to go into these other communities and, and get out with folks, look for suspicious people. If somebody's driving suspiciously, you might want to stop that car and figure out who they are. Well, the officers look at command staff and say, hey, by the way, you're the same one who told us don't do that. Now you're telling us do do that. And we had to let them know, hey, there's a balance here. We got a balance between how we're going to protect ourselves and how we're going to protect our community. We just can't let violence uh, spread in these socioeconomic depressed communities. We do have a commitment to those communities also. So communication um, was vital, transparency, explaining the why. I talked about the communication, I talked about the daily email up, updates, or in our world, we call them situational awareness reports, um, but they're really just emails. Uh, but we had to explain the why. When we made a decision, right, why did we make that decision? Was there a science behind it or is it just because I told you so? Hopefully it wasn't the latter, right? It was the former. Um, and I think that really helped. I got a lot of, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about our daily emails. I mean, a ton. It's been all positive. And um, I've, I've let them, everybody know, I mean, it's very flattering for them to think it had something to do with me. I mean, I'm the one sending it out, but I've told them this has been a conscious effort by our command staff to have one voice during this crisis. So yes, I am that voice, I'm the one sending it out, but they've made the decision too to allow me to send that out without sending out countering messages. Power is something which is so um, interesting in a leadership perspective. And if you ask patrol officers, line folks, what are their worst 20 minutes of the day? Most people will tell you it's when I come to patrol briefing, believe it or not. And the funny thing is, is because that's where they have the least amount of power of their entire day. And I'm not talking about those egomaniac, power hungry guys who throw their power around on the street. I'm talking about most police officers are self-directed individuals. They get sent to calls for service, but a lot of times what they do is self-directed until they come to the police department where we tell people what to do and we give them direction. So um, we had to be very cognizant of the idea that command, us, including me, we work in relatively safety. I mean, my kind of confines in my office right here are relatively safe. I control who comes through my door. Nobody from the community comes to our station and everybody who comes in gets screened to see if they're coughing or have a fever. I'm in relative safety right here, but we're sending our folks out into a very contagious environment. So we had to be cognizant of that contrast and that power difference. And uh, we just do the best we can, but it's something we had to keep in the back of our minds. And I hope, I, I hope we did. And last but not least, support. You know, you have direct supervisors are the key to keeping their eyes on their specific teammates to make sure that they're not overstressing. They need to watch them. They need to really listen 
and, um, and and know them and have those relationships to where somebody will come up to one of their line supervisors and tell them how they're feeling and what's going on. And then if it's something that can change, hey, voice those concerns up the chain of command and let's see if we can make a, make a change at a command level that will make our line folks feel safer, whether it's civilian line folks or our sworn. Um, because that's ultimately that what it's there for. You know, we have an uh, uh, employee assistance program, which is there. We just have a new provider online who's a former police officer, and I think he's going to do a real wonderful job. Our peer support team is still available, and um, uh, early on we got them we got them to call those folks who are on quarantine to check to make sure they're okay. And there I am. That was the presentation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, would you please uh, take a few seconds to think about questions that you have? And since we are not uh, such a large group, I really, um, Captain, can you please uh, stop sharing so you can see all of us? It, I think it will be, yeah. And since we are not such a large group, I really encourage you to open the mics and share your thoughts or questions that you have. Uh, or you can write in the chat if you feel more comfortable with this. Come on, guys, bring them to me. Uh, you mentioned motivation. What do you do specifically to motivate the troops? How do you keep their energy level high in a situation uh, that we're confined with, with, with uh, today? Yeah, it's really hard. And um, I think in general, uh, motivation is tough regardless at the command level. You know, we need to create an environment at the command level that gives our line folks and our line uh, supervisors, even up to that lieutenant level, the ability to do things, uh, to really interact one-on-one -on -one with those individuals, to know what motivates them. Motivation is internal, and as a, as a direct boss, right, you gotta know your folks well enough to kind of figure out what makes them tick and what makes them and motivates them to, um, to do the best job they can. So, you know, some people want to say it's money. I don't think it's money. It's, it's caring. It's, it's um, do you as a boss have the best interest in mind of me as a, a line worker? And um, when that happens, you get motivated. And then you can build those relationships between the sergeants and the patrol officers or the civilian supervisors and their staff. Um, but it's tough in a situation like this because – Mentally, I think there was so much stress put on our folks who were working in the field uh, because, you know, what I, what I didn't mention is they didn't want to really bring this thing home. If you lived by yourself, it wasn't that big of a deal. If you lived with your wife, maybe not. But what if you live with kids? What if your wife had some underlying health issues? What if your parents had underlying health issues and you lived with them? For me personally, my parents, my dad is 85 and my mom's 81. They live in uh, South Florida. I couldn't go visit them. Now, I just visited them recently, and it's only because uh, University of Florida is now offered. This is one thing I didn't mention about. That was a great question there, Rick. Um, the the, um, the University of Florida set up a research program to allow first responders, emergency room doctors, and you know, fire and rescue and stuff to get tested once a week. And once that got implemented, our officers really started engaging in that free testing. Because from a research perspective, the idea is how prevalent is it in our community and how is it affecting our first responders? But for our officers, and the peace of mind it created was huge. You could actually see a difference because now they had a capacity to not have to worry about whether they were sick. Uh, they could actually go do something about it. And they were, they're offering testing once a week. 
So um, I was able to get tested last week. So when I went to go visit my parents, uh, I felt a lot more comfortable knowing I wasn't bringing anything to them. Um, because at my age, I should be okay if I catch it. My dad has uh, COPD. If he caught it and my mom caught it, it was most likely a death sentence for either one of them. And I would never have wanted to bring that to them. So as a stress reliever, things have been, that's a little bit of a game changer for our, for the relationship with our folks here. Plus, I think in general, people have realized it, it wasn't going to be as bad in Florida as what you saw in New York City, in New Jersey, and obviously overseas in Italy. Initial, we had no idea. We thought that could look like our community, but it never turned out to be that way. Thank you, Rick, for that question. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about the creative solutions with domestic violence cases, because I know that it was, it's a very sensitive issue, and you said that you couldn't just go and check on people because it would be a trigger for more violence. Sure. So um, I'm not sure what exactly the city manager had in mind. Like if I think he thought that if you have a previous history of domestic violence, we're just going to go do a check on you. And we're like, no, you can't. That's not possible. We have a very, um, our domestic violence unit, I mean, you know, a lot of you understand the, uh, the LAP program or the Least Lethality Assessment Protocol. And we've had that implemented here for 10 years or so. And about five years ago, we implemented a program that if you scored a high lap, we would go physically to your house, knock on your door with a, um, a, uh, a victim advocate to check on you. We would only do that if the bad guy was in jail at the time. We would always make sure that you were alone when we made those, um, those contacts. Well, we had to stop doing that because our victim advocates had stopped face-to-face -face contact with most of their their clients. So they had to get creative in the ways they communicate with these individuals, a lot more by phone. I'm sure they were using some Zoom phone uh, formats and face-to-face -face contact, tele teleconferencing and stuff. So um, it's definitely a different environment the way we work with victims now than we did six weeks ago. And, and the interesting thing to us is like, when is that going to get back to the way it was? You know, are we a month away from getting back to the way it was? Or are we six months away from getting back to the way it was when we were trying to engage these victims um, in person to make sure they had the, uh, the safety planning and the resources they needed uh, early on? when they're more likely to accept it. Um, I threw up a question, but um, I'd be happy to ask it through um, voice. Um, with the pace of information that you had um, coming out, um, a lot of it just trying to figure out what is accurate, um, what is opinion-based versus not opinion-based. Um, what did you do as a way to kind of filter what went into your daily messages that you send out? Yeah, that's, um, you know, uh, I'll be so for, for me, I am a, you know, I don't want to say I'm a funny guy, but I do. I like to joke. I like sarcasm. So I had to, number one, I had to rule sarcasm out for the most part, right? This had to be more official. Um, I wanted to kind of, I, I never put out information that I thought was questionable. Um, or if I did, I made sure that it was qualified in a way that we didn't know this to be certain, but I had to be transparent too, right, Eric? So it's like a combination of, I'm not trying to hide anything from our teammates, but if I couldn't confirm it, how do I put it out without over worrying them? Did I wait 24 hours to put it out? And that's sometimes what I did is, if it was something that was a little bit more, could create a little bit more fear, I might have waited 24 hours to see if that thing changed or see if I could narrow down or get another professional to kind of talk about it before I communicated out to the troops. So um, uh, yeah, there was that time when uh, some messaging did change. I remember there was a, a message put out there that uh, N95 masks had to be kept in paper bags. If you kept an N95 mask in a plastic bag, it would deteriorate the, the mask and you would, it would go bad. And I put that out. Well, guess what? 24 hours later, they realized that that was some internet rumor 
that wasn't true. And then I had to go back and correct myself. So um, it was a balancing act, Eric. I don't know how to tell you. And I don't know if I did a great job or if I did a poor job. Now, I did talk a little bit about trying to get my own mind out of making decisions for other folks coming back to work. We had an incident where an officer, um, we had preached and preached and preached social distancing, right? Be careful. You can catch this from fellow officers. We had an officer come down with a serious flu. I mean, he thought for sure, no question, he had coronavirus. Well, his three buddies said they were exposed to him. Well, I was upset at that point because you should not have been exposed to another person because you should have been socially distancing, right? And that got into my mind. And uh, I had to pull myself back and let uh, uh, our uh, employee health services kind of take over this as a neutral third party, working with their doctors and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's some times when you have to pull yourself back and, 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 and look yourself in the mirror and realize that, you're the problem in this situation, not those other guys. Leave them alone. Um, and we did. We figured it out. I, I just already posted a question for you, Mike. To piggyback on Paula's question, if you know, uh, what, if any, issues are still being addressed by your courts? And by that, I'm specifically thinking of domestic violence, child welfare, and juvenile shelters or emergencies. And uh, in Maryland, our courts are closed till June the 5th, but those specific issues, if emergent in nature, are in the courtroom. All other issues then are going to be some type of, not Zoom, our courts are not using that, but some other type uh, of internet uh, communication. And I know that police officers are an integral part of this and witnesses. So just wondering what you know. So like our, um, most of our domestic violence cases when they're, uh, an arrest is made, um, we have something in Florida called first appearance where you have to go to first appearance the next morning and the judge will impose sanctions on you. Even if they release you on your own recognizance, They'll have a no contact with the victim, must maintain alternate residence, uh, stuff like that. We have done that by, uh, by tele, um, teleconferencing for the last 25 years. So that hasn't changed. So we're still able, once they take the person to jail, the defendant stands at the jail, the judge is in his, uh, at the courtroom and imposes those sanctions through the court record. So luckily we already had that in place. Um, and we we're able to continue to um, put those sanctions uh, reference domestic violence. They're still having emergency court hearings uh, at the uh, courthouse in the same type of situations you're talking about, Donna. Um, me being in patrol support, I'm not as much engaged in the as domestic violence as I used to be. I, before I became a captain, I was the commander of our criminal investigations division, wrote grants for those things. Um, so I'm a little bit pulled back from where I was three years ago. Um, I still know a lot, about that, but um, I don't know exactly every question you're at. I know they're still on the emergency injunction hearings and stuff like that, though. They are still doing those. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You for the, thank you for the invitation.